30 minutes to board is enough time for me. So over a decade ago, closer to two decades, I was really feeling quite good about myself when I arrived at the airport a little earlier than I had anticipated. I had the feeling like when you've packed up home, you feel like you've packed everything, you haven't missed anything, you've got your gears, you've got your accessories, and you're ready to go on vacation. I walked up to the pre-check-in area, I gave my information, and the machine had a problem pulling my information up. No worries, I'm at the airport early. So I walk up to the teller. I had booked my ticket months ago on United. I am now here at O'Hare. I'm at the teller, and I hand over my information. And the teller, much like me, has a similar experience, not being able to find my information and the flight. After going through this a couple of times, we discovered something that I did not know, that there were a few flights on United that did not leave out of O'Hare. There are a couple of flights booked through United that left out of Midway Airport. Imagine this feeling of feeling like you're at the airport early unravel when you realize that you are at the wrong airport with the same departure time. Suddenly, I wasn't so early anymore, and my relaxed feeling was replaced with deep concern as I tried to anticipate the impossible. How was I gonna get from one airport to the air other airport and catch my airplane on time? I imagine the disciples felt like they were at the wrong airport in the text today. Like three and a half years earlier, they had been recruited by the Jesus movement. They had learned the job on the road. Entry level position will receive training on the job. And for three or more, little over three years, they basically on foot studied, learned, prayed and witnessed miracles and signs by none other than JC. They had him up close and personal. While others were drawn to this magnetic personality, the disciples got to see him day in and day out. They had really become quite capable and good at following Jesus. He was getting all kinds of messages on his spiritual GPS about needing to go to this place and needing to go to that place, and the disciples just tagged along and went with him. And for three years with Jesus, they were like passengers in a fast car with Jesus at the wheel. They didn't always understand what Jesus was talking about, they sort of pretended and went along anyhow. Sometimes it was later revealed that they didn't exactly understand what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was agitated and often intent and always feeling this sense of urgency about ministry, about people. Oh, so when he said stuff like he was going to return to his father, they just dismissed him until they no longer couldn't. It wasn't a knee to the neck, but it was just as violent. Jesus' death, and then it was finished. And now the followers of Jesus are at O'Hare, and they don't know what to do. It's one thing to follow, but it's another when the person you're following is no longer around. And so we find ourselves early but late, all at the same time standing at O'Hare Airport <clears throat> with only one set of directions. Jesus says, wait for it. Wait for it. So they made their way to Midway, and they waited for their instructions. So they sheltered in place. They socially distanced themselves. They grew anxious. They lingered in the upper room. They were at a standstill. 
there's this beautiful spiritual that says there's so many things about tomorrow that I can't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. They were in shock, not being able to understand right what was in front of them. With the murder, the murder of their Lord and Savior Jesus freshly in their memories. The passions and the palms freshly placked in their bodies. They didn't try to open the church and continue business as usual. They knew things would never be the same again. And And that's how they dealt with the trauma of their murdered leader. But don't get it twisted. Some turned inward and some turned outwards. They waited for something or someone to pull them out of their psychological misery. And then something happens. Different people begin to speak in different tongues. There are different languages present in the room. There is one voice among many that pierces my ears this morning, and that is the dead voice of George Floyd. Seven days ago, he was seized by the cops for supposedly forged money. When the police arrived on the scene to a follow-up phone call, George was sitting with a friend in his car across the street. George Floyd was a regular to this store, but on this day, the general manager was not present, and the person working called the police. George wasn't himself, but George wasn't armed, and he hadn't presented a physical threat, and he certainly hadn't killed anyone. He wasn't armed with weapons, walking around, insisting that businesses be opened back up again. He hadn't been packing, insisting on his second right amendments. He hadn't walked in anyone's church and gunned down members. In fact, the tape shows him handcuffed long before he was on the ground walking cuffed with two other officers. He was apprehended and something triggered him. He pinned down. He is unable to move. He begs and he begs and he begs for his life over and over again. He says, you are killing me. Now folks on the street began to speak in tongues too in their multiple tongues speaking at the same time begging for them to let this man up. Let him up, he can't breathe. And Officer Derek, all he has to add to the conversation is relax. Relax with three people on your body. Relax with my knee in your neck. George says in another tongue, my stomach hurts. My neck hurts. Everything hurts. Water something, please, please. And then we watch as his body surrenders and there are less and less words. And then there are no tongues. And he's quiet. And we can see that he's unconscious. We don't have a language problem in America. We have a racism problem. We don't have 
an inability to understand each other in America. We have an inability to look at America's sin problem and call it for what it is. Our country was built on the notion that one people are superior to all other groups, and this has torn our country apart. We don't have a language problem. We have a notion that this group of people is better than all other people. Those police officers, a couple Four years ago, I learned how to knit. I already knew how to crochet. But there's this thing about knitting and crocheting. It's inevitable, inevitable that you will make a mistake. It's not when it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I sit among others that are much more capable than I, and it happens. You make a mistake. And you have to decide. Is the mistake big enough to address it, or can I simply go on and fix the mistake as I go? Oftentimes, you have to pull apart many rows and much of what you've already done to address the mistake. It's time for us to realize that our ass is showing to the world and deal with our mistake. We really need to go back and address the tear that has been happening in the fabric of our country that has us exposed, that has the world talking about us. Canada apologized to the Native Americans. Germany apologized to the Jews. South Africa still has more work to do, but they held the truth and reconciliation here is, and they apologized for apartheid. Australia apologized to the Aborigines. And America still has not fallen on her knees more dangerous than any COVID-19. Lingering in the air is white supremacy. And so in the text today, those looking on began to spin a narrative on what was happening, saying the folks gathered there were drunk, not understanding the move of the Holy Spirit or the times in which we live. They began to spin a narrative that simply wasn't true. You got it all wrong. These men are not drunk. Peter speaks up and says, not on my watch, not on my watch. All the way from the White House, once again from our talk dog, describing those gathered as thugs, not on my watch. These are not low down, dirty for nothing brothers. These are not criminals. These are not people resist a word for. you. Sometimes it's appropriate to turn the other cheek, but sometimes, just like Jesus in his example, it's appropriate to turn the tables over, good Christians. Michael Brown, Philando Castile, Laquan McDonald, Botham Shin, Ahmad Arbor, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, Jesus Christ, and the list goes on and on and on. <clears throat> Some 
sometimes it's okay to lose it when black and brown bodies are murdered until there is an outcry and a video is released that allows police to roam freely in our country. It's okay to put your hymns down and scream makes me want to holler the way they do my life. Makes me want to holler the way they do my life. It's okay to protest peacefully. It's okay to sign petitions. It's okay to cry. It's okay to have gut-wrenching anger when the police enter a woman's home looking for one man and the woman ends up dead. It's okay to be mad and cry out and turn over the tables. Silence is not a luxury we can afford. May the Pentecost that provided meaning and power to the disciples find us and knock us over. What happened on Pentecost changed the disciples. They would never go back to who they were. The enormity of the situation touches them. Have you ever gone through something in life that touches you in such a way that you know you will never be the same again? The freshness of Jesus' death was there, but now they knew the work that lay ahead. They were not just disciples riding in the car in the passenger seat following Jesus, but now they were leaders. They were apostles. They were men given authority. So many things about tomorrow make us clear. about our role and our purpose as we embrace our prophetic role to speak truth to power even if the hands of the empire seem no match for us. There's a new normal emerging in our country and we cannot go back to the way we used to even do church. There is a growing restlessness in America and it cannot be ignored. Well, I began today with a story of me ending up in the wrong airport. I swear, I don't know how some of the things happened to me that happened, but thank God for Jesus. It was certainly a costly mistake when I realized at O'Hare that I was at the wrong airport. I did finally make it over to Midway, but as you can anticipate, the plane had already left. It was hard for me to reconcile this fact, but I had a whole night in the airport to come to terms with it. Sometimes we struggle with what's right before us, twisting and asking questions because it's so hard to chew and swallow the truth. It wasn't in my plans to stay so long, but my own actions contributed to me having to take another plane, which didn't leave until 6 a.m. the next morning. Certainly hadn't been in my vision that the cards were stacked up against me to be lingering around. But morning did come, and 9-11 came, and the way we traveled changed forever, and there was a new normal. I suspect that we are in a vulnerable space right now. And there will be a new normal we can't even fully see. But I'm inviting you, United Church of Hyde Park, to wait for it. Wait for it. I'm inviting you to receive the Holy Spirit. 
I'm inviting you to be touched by what is happening in our world and move into that new normal. Because there is no going back. We will take all of what we know into the future. We will take all of what happens in the upper room with us. We will take the spirit of the living God with us. The world needs us to be the church. Amen. <laughs>